Support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Whether election season or not, in the Old North State at least, there has been no shortage of partisan debate and social dissension. Welcome back and thanks so much for supporting the longest running and the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy. I am Chris William and in a moment, North Carolina's and the McCrory administration's chief commercial officer and external cheerleader when it comes to economic, community and workforce development issues. We will talk with North Carolina Secretary of Commerce, John Scavarla. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring John Scavarla, North Carolina's Secretary of Commerce. Hello, welcome to our program. Mr. Secretary, uh, good to have you here. Welcome back to Charlotte. Welcome back uh, to our program. Thank you. Chris, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Well, and now you seem to be, if you don't mind me saying, you seem to be smiling a little easier because there seems to be a, a raft of, uh, of good economic news for the state of North Carolina. Um, let's talk about that for just a minute, Your Honor. You've got uh, Site Selection Magazine has confirmed what North Carolina, one of North Carolina's hallmarks for for decades it's been. It's been, a, it's been a great destination for business and commerce and industry, a place to live. Uh, we got kind of off on that with some of the social issues later, but uh, lately, but Site Selection Magazine said, nope, number two, still a good place to do it. Um, and many other announcements. Let's talk about that for a minute. Where did all of these good announcements come from? What do you think is behind that? Well, and Forbes just yesterday named us for the second year in a row number two best place to do business. And CNBC, of all organizations, has us at number four just recently, within the last yeah. month or so. So it is amazing. Uh, Chris, the state of North Carolina for the last three years has been absolutely on fire. Uh, people ask me about um, active projects in the pipeline, and obviously by law I can't talk about specifics, but we don't have tens, we don't have do dozens, we have hundreds of active projects in the pipeline. North Carolina has been recognized because of its uh, business environment, its tax climate, its regulatory environment, our customer service attitude, our natural resources, mountains to see with yeah. golf courses in the middle. Uh, I get a call almost every week from a CEO or some senior executive. Uh, and it's interesting because there's three states I'm primarily hearing from, California, New York, and Illinois. And, wh and what uh, do they say? Oh, they say, get me out of here. They say, uh, literally, get me out of here because we cannot afford the 13% individual tax rate for our employees that aren't making millions of dollars a year. The commutes are just horrific. Mm -hmm. Uh, the weather is not good in New York and Illinois. There's a union environment. They say we cannot continue to grow and expand our business in these states. Get me to North Carolina. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it is, uh, the, certainly we do our share of recruiting and so forth, but we are being recruited. But it's not the only choice, though. You've got South Carolina that's figured out the North Carolina formula yes, to some have. degree. You've got Virginia. You've got a lot of the southeastern states that have gotten kind of clued in to what North Carolina did 20, 20, 30 years ago to kind of build this momentum. So as the competition's gotten harder in incentives, in, in climate, 
in uh, transportation. How, how does North Carolina hold itself out to be separate and say, and with these these calls, as you talked about, Your Honor, is they come in, are, I know they're not just coming into North Carolina, but how do you win the jobs? Well, at the end of the day, you know, and, and there's hundreds of criteria that go into a site selection and a conclusion. But at the end of the day, the board of directors probably considers four factors. Mm -hmm. Number one is workforce. And we have the most robust community college, university system in the United States. It is just phenomenal. And we have integrated our workforce recruitment all the way down into the eighth grade or our workforce development, where we're actually getting kids in the eighth grade to understand what a career pathway can be for them. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can uh, uh, start an apprenticeship in high school. They can get a certificate while they're in high school. They can segue onto the community college system and they can continue to climb the ladder and stay on as long as they, uh, they would like. My favorite day is when I'm asked to be the commencement speaker at a community college and these young students come up and they get their associate's degree and two or three weeks later they graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. We have got it so well integrated. Our apprenticeship program has doubled each year for the last two years. We have 600 companies involved in apprenticeship. We've probably got 5,000 students participating in it. And these students are realizing you don't have to get a PhD in order to be highly successful and we can help you mm -hmm. very early on find out what that is. So number one, number two, and number three is workforce. And then you add all the other criteria of regulatory uh, environment, customer service, tax mm -hmm. environment, our mm -hmm. corporate tax rate is 3%. Mm -hmm. Our individual tax rate is uh, 5.4 at, at, at the top. Um, California's 13% individual income tax rate. We're doing all the right things and we're being recognized. Climate, you know, we're rated the number one best climate in the United States mm -hmm. overall, have been for decades. So we've got a lot of uh, nice natural characteristics plus our focus on, uh, on economic growth. How, how, does that, how does that all get lost? It's an election year and not just House Bill 2, but all of the other social issues that end up being kind of the, and a rub would be, be, be a nice way to say it. Some of the acute passion on the left and the right have bubbled up into all kinds of things. So how does that get lost in all of this debate around HB2 to, say, to pick one? Well, I think at the end of the day, when you're doing this well, people presume fundamental economics. They don't realize that fundamental economics is still the foundation under the house. So they get lost in the social issues because they presume the fundamentals are always going to be there, mm -hmm. which is just not the case. It takes serious operational effort, serious operational focus to make sure that foundation doesn't crack and fall down. And so once you put the foundation under the house and people start presuming it's always going to be there, then you get mm -hmm. diverted with social issues. Does, does the, it, let's talk about House Bill 2 for just a second. I know it's something you've heard of. Ah, <laughs> just, just, uh, just well, it's funny, at, at, at Environment Natural Resources, I had coal ash, and now I've got House Bill 2, you know, so. <laughs> the fun uh, keeps coming. Yeah. Um, so, not, and, and not to be, not to be flippant about it, sir, I, 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 I want to be serious and, and understand that they're respectful on both sides of this. Uh, Around House Bill 2, we have seen some high-profile defections in the last hour. Things like PayPal that decided not going to Charlotte because we don't like the message that that sends to the social fabric. Or about North Carolina. CoStar recently decided to move to Richmond. Uh, the NCAA, some of the ACC playoffs, uh, the NBA All-Star Games. All have put a stake in the ground to say we don't want to tie our brand to North Carolina because we don't like this. My que I got a couple questions here, Your Honor. How, so as a leader of the state, and people will say about you, he's thoughtful, he's smart, um, but how do you, how do you talk about this publicly and not have whatever you say not be seen as dismissive to HB2 and insensitive to HB2? How, how, how do you make sure that that's still uh, something that you, not necessarily Governor McCrory, while it would be nice, but how, how can people uh, be sure that you are hearing this debate and take it for what it is and not just passing it off? Well, it's a legitimate question, and there's no doubt that this, what I'll call international eruption, I mean, it, it is truly a Vesuvial eruption. My brother-in-law was in Rome, Italy, about a month after this started, and I got a text, and he said, hey, I just saw you on TV in Rome. So let me tell you, it was an organized initiative to make North Carolina the epicenter of this issue. Mm -hmm. 
because because as we had discussed, uh, you know, Texas went through the same thing, and you didn't hear a peep about Houston turning down the same ordinance that Charlotte passed before Charlotte passed it. Uh, and then they held the NCAA basketball tournament there in 16. So clearly North Carolina is the epicenter, but it's because we're a swing state. Texas was not a swing state. Mm -hmm. There was no sense doing it in Texas because they weren't going to turn the vote. So without doubt, this has come as a result that our economic performance has been so stellar that you can't run against a phenomenal economic. Mm -hmm. We are arguably the number one economically performing state in the United States. Would you have would you have some of these companies that it said no we're not going to come now. Do you have debrief calls to say we understand your your point of view. Um, what can we do to change your mind? How I mean do you have a follow up call with this and what is that dialogue like if you do? Well, the dialogue is basically that um, they didn't as a rule truly understand the bill. Now, I can't say that in all cases cuz some you know PayPal contends they did. And you talk about CoStar, you know, they've never said they didn't come because of HB2. A, uh, realtor, real a realtor guy, and that was yeah. retracted by his boss that day. His boss said no, he spoke out of um, the heat of the moment. Well, but you and, can't uh, unring that bell to some degree, You right? can't unring the bell, but yeah. uh, CoStar has never said they didn't come because of HB2. Okay. They have not come. And we lose a lot of companies. You know, when you get to the final four, as I call it, it's an eyelash difference as to what might be the deciding factor, whether it's the incentives or the, or the workforce or the location or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it, it has certainly been a topic of conversation. The flip side is that we have got hundreds of active projects in the pipeline. Our active pipeline has not diminished one iota, not tens, not dozens, but hundreds. And I'm talking to CEOs all the time, as recently as yesterday. And the message is the same. I need to move to North Carolina. I cannot continue to afford to do business in the state that I'm in. And those three states I'm primarily hearing from are New York, Illinois, and California. They just cannot mm. afford to continue to grow there. Well, not to give up confidences, but will these CEOs of these other companies that are in the pipeline, do they bring up the social challenges in North Carolina? Not once. Not even once? Not once. So not once. So let's go back to the beginning of this. So do you think this debate, whether whether it's just social, whether it's economic, do you feel like maybe that the the social debate in North Carolina and the economic reality and the budget reality are two different things speaking two different languages? And yes. not to diminish either one, but how, so how do we find? What's an appropriate dialogue to have in this state? Because it is a purple state, as you said. It it's a progressive purple. state. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we go in the right direction so in the next five or ten years it doesn't become more acute? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because my major complaint, and, and thank you for having me on, because my major complaint with the print media is that if you read the newspapers all over the state, you think the state is ready for bankruptcy. That we are... In what way? that financially, because the NBA isn't having the all-star game here, that we should all go drink hemlock because we are on our, our last nickel and we're ready to file. And what they failed to do is put in perspective that we're a $510 billion economy in this state. Mm -hmm. We're the 23rd largest country in the world. If we were a country. Yeah. If we were a country. And we're the ninth largest state in the United States by population and by GDP. We're arguably one of the fastest growing GDPs in the United States with the number one in migration state in the United States of people moving here. People are flocking to North Carolina. So yes, do we need to be sensitive to the social issue? W without doubt, somebody asked me one time, uh, which was easier, coal ash or uh, HB2? And I said, coal ash, it's quantifiable. You can dig it up or cover it up or truck it off or whatever you do. This is a serious, sensitive, emotional issue that people are very passionate about, but there's no easy answer. There's no, so, yeah, so ahead, what, I, what I'm saying is that once you put the economy in perspective, then we have to figure out how to address the sensitive side of the issue. So, and you, I know you can't speak, Mr. Secretary, for the General Assembly, for the House, for the Senate, not really even for the governor mm -hmm. in many ways, in some ways, but, 
how, so then going forward, let's say, uh, let's say we do find some common ground on House Bill 2, and in five years from now, it's become a thing we look back on as, as a teaching moment and mm -hmm. a learning lesson for, for the Tar Heel State. And the next thing comes up. So how do we gird ourselves? How, does, how do the Carolinas need to think about this new world that they're in, that they're clearly at the center of growth and development, and, and as, as, as the area grows, mm -hmm. so is the area's influence going to grow, and we've got to get up to the varsity squad when it comes to management and leadership in the region. How do we do that? Well, hopefully we have learned a lesson from this international Vesuvial eruption that we've experienced. Hopefully we can do some things going forward to mitigate that, that problem. Because the one side could take the position, hey, our economy's still humming, so be it. The other side could take the position that we're gonna do everything we can to continue to diminish the economy mm -hmm. from humming because of social issues. And everybody's got to get honest about the fact that there probably is some resolution of this uh, a deal apparently was brokered with the General Assembly uh, to eliminate HB2 if Charlotte would eliminate the ordinance so we could return the state to where it was before we created this problem because we didn't have a problem. It was artificially created. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently, uh, you know, uh, the Democrats didn't want to do that, which to me bears out the fact that this is a politically motivated issue because if they cared so much about the economy, they would have brokered mm -hmm. the deal and said, let's return to the status quo ante and, uh, and um, get this thing off the table, but they didn't. So yeah. I'm hoping after the election that things will take a, number one, a natural mitigation tone, and then two people can take a deep breath and say, okay, what do we need to do? So looking forward, the big challenge is there's a long legislative session coming up, and it's uh, no doubt going to be action-packed and filled with a lot of policy debate. Uh, transportation, education are clearly at the top of everyone's list. How do we find different ways of not just fixing a funding issue, but adding to an instance of a, another billion dollars for transportation? Is that figuring out that we need to be more, div <laughs> this is just my thought, Mr. Secretary, but uh, figuring out how we can include all of the regions, in, in your case of North Carolina, to have more talk and leadership and not just have a centralized a power structure in Raleigh, or is, it, is there something else that we need to be thinking about and you think will show up next year? Well, the good news is when we're thinking a little bit more globally, uh, if you take the 25-year transportation plan, for instance, it truly talked about and talks about and is focused on connecting regions together. I mean, getting the western part of the state connected to the ports is a wonderful thing. Charlotte has got this wonderful intermodal facility. How do we connect that intermodal facility to other areas of the state? And we're doing that pretty well. The, uh, the CSX announcement in Rocky Mountain is probably the biggest announcement in the history of eastern North Carolina. That is going to be transformative. That certainly is connectivity because, you know, that's in essence a, a hub. And they connect that to their other intermodal facilities and then they can uh, um, uh, redistribute the cargo and, and move it on. So we definitely, if anybody in the world, Pat McCrory, understands this regional concept, having been the mayor of Charlotte and seeing mm -hmm. that Rock Hill, South Carolina's recruiting brochure has the Charlotte skyline yeah. and the Charlotte Douglas Airport in it, they're smart. We need to do that in the, in the uh, Norfolk, Virginia area with the northeast corner of the state. Do you, do you ever and, worry about that CSX announcement turning into a global trans park issue from, from days of yore in North Carolina? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think it's just the opposite because they've got experience. And I visited personally the, um, their hub up in uh, Baltimore, North Baltimore, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And this will be more state of the art than that. And their experience up there has been phenomenal. Don't hold me to this exact number, but they've got several of these hubs now across the country. And they have taken the time for a, a container to get from the west coast to the east coast from nine days to three days. So I think that is going to be nothing but a major expansionary item for eastern North Carolina. How about, how about I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we got so many things sure, we got to shoe on into. Sure, we could do this for into. two days. Uh, 
Education. Where do you think education funding is going to find its, its, its most sympathy and increase? Well, you know, we've, we have spent more on education than any state in the United States since McCrory's been here. We spent over a billion dollars on education. And you need to have Catherine Truitt on here. She's absolutely remarkable. And she can give you the hard data if she hasn't been here already. But we have spent more than any state in the United States on education funding uh, in the last two years. I think it's a billion dollars. Not only teacher pay, but um, uh, infrastructure items. And we're number two in the United States for broadband spending, which ties education right together. We're the number two state in the United States for broadband spending. So we recognize that especially if you're gonna ha help the less than urban areas, you've gotta have that connectivity. Because you can start a lot of interesting businesses as long as you have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. And so if we continue, well, we're working on a project, in, for instance, to put Wi-Fi on school buses. Not only does it help the kids with their homework, it keeps them from fighting with each other. <laughs> you might have some pushback from parents on that. No, I think it's, it's been very, we've, we've got an experiment going in one county, in Montgomery County, yeah. and it's going beautifully. So we're talking to the various carriers and providers to see if we can't get that initiative more robust. And, so, and, and any uniqueness in um, sales tax? Any other thought about a user tax instead of just a, because arguably the General Assembly has done a, a, a respectable job lowering the corporate tax, and lowering personal the income tax. And spread the so days, yeah. how do you raise revenue? How do you think about raising, using the term raising revenue instead of raising taxes? Top line, you create more jobs. You know, as, 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 a, as a, a guy who has run business his whole life, I always kid about the fact that you can have lousy operations. If you've got a great top line, you can cover up yeah. a lot of operating ills. Oh, sure. But our way to raise revenue is uh, more, more jobs, more economy, more economic growth. I think our projection is up 3% for the first quarter. It was up 185 million or 58. Gross state product? Yeah, uh, gross state revenue. Our revenues are up 3% over projection. So we're continue, if you, as long as you continue to grow the economy, you can grow right by all the needs to raise taxes. You, you sound so confident, Your Honor, in so many ways, and I, I, I know that about you. Well, I mean, when you're driving down the road by yourself, not with your entourage, and you're thinking <laughs> in your car, not necessarily about your family, but the challenges, I mean, what keeps coming up to say, you know, this thing's a bugaboo, and if we don't fix it, it's going to be a problem? Well, I'm, I'm anticipating, and I could be dead wrong, but I'm anticipating that our issues with HB2 are going to subside dramatically after the election, one way or the other. So this too shall pass, as Confucius say, if we can do some things in the long session to maybe make that even a little bit more aggressively come to fruition, I would like to see that. I think the governor would like to see it. You know, the governor has always said he is wide open to any discussion, any suggestion at any time. So I'm going to write that off to politics because when they refused to compromise on the Charlotte ordinance and repealing the bill, that told me everything I need to know. Let's see what happens mm -hmm. next Tuesday and we'll go on from there. But what keeps me, um, what keeps me focused is not just the laurels that we can rest on because our statistical data, Chris, I could, I could give you two hours of our positive statistical data. Operationally, we're the best the state has ever been financially we're the best the state has ever been. We've paid off $2.6 billion in unemployment insurance mm -hmm, debt, yeah. and our, our trust fund there is $2.2 billion. You think they're going to have to do something about Medicaid funding? You uh, think that, you think there'll be some sympathetic years about taking those federal dollars? I, I would be surprised at this point in time. I would be surprised at this, because the states now that did it, my information, and you probably need to talk to Rick Brazier, my information... Who was is, here three weeks ago. Yeah, right? Who's some of the states that have taken it have not been happy with the fact that they expanded. I think the uh, expectation would be let's fix the program from the top down because it is a federal program. So will that be, as we've heard, premiums have gone up, major Ooh. insurers have dropped out. Will that will that be the pressure point before there are more states taking those monies? Is oh, that I what would you're think thinking? so. I, well, what did I hear this morning? I heard an interview with uh, someone in Raleigh and their premium for their family of four is going up 70%. Yeah. I mean, this is serious. It is the number one issue I hear with all businesses I talk to is the cost of health care. Not the cost of employment, but the cost of health care. Uh, Obamacare yeah. is, is really turned out to be something very different than it was uh, promised to yeah. be. So that's number one. But my, my issues uh, 
now what what are we going to continue to do for you mentioned the highways and we've got you know, about 20 seconds yeah um, you know uh, hopefully the highway trust fund will be dedicated to uh, yeah. to the highways now instead of being <laughs> used for other purposes yeah. and that was the purpose of the bond so yeah. we're uh, I am so optimistic but I'm, I'm realistic and I've lived it and I can tell you, we're the best operationally and financially we've yep. ever been in the history of the state. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you. I hate to cut you off because I know you got some uh, real head of steam here. Uh, congratulations on some great announcements and thanks for your leadership. Good to see you. Thank yeah. you, Chris. Always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. And thank you for watching. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit CarolinaBusinessReview.org.